I'm going to go to rate of knots through this um, just to get a handle on Chinese urbanism, uh, Chinese green urbanism, smart urbanism, sustainable urbanism, you know, whatever you want to call it, and take a look at a, a couple of these points. It's going to be a bit of a jumble, a bit of a romp through uh, some of the Chinese uh, discussions on urban development. Uh, and I don't really know how many of you are in the audience are au fait or how many of you are uh, novices in this conversation. So when I ask questions like this, if, I didn't realize it would be that small, sorry. That says, what do we know about China? Uh, what do we know? Obviously, you might know a lot about China, right? But general terms, what do we perceive about China, especially in terms of urbanism and architecture? NAF architecture, as we call it in the trade. Uh, so you have things like the, um, the Lucky Coin building. Um, do I have a cursor? This one here, the Lucky 8 building. If you look at the architect's uh, drawing, the reflection in a beautiful, pristine water pool uh, makes that into a number 8. Lucky 8, obviously it's a dirty river, so it doesn't really work. Uh, we have uh, the Teapot Museum. We have the Great uh, Hebei uh, Museum. Uh, sorry, the hotel. Um, and I suppose the less said about that one, the better. Uh, that's the official organ of the uh, Communist Party. Uh, uh, but, you know, so we have these kind of contradictory imaginations about, you know, China building these kind of fake Eiffel Towers and all the rest of it. But in fact, you also have this kind of thing with Donggong architects in Baidehe in the uh, north of, uh, northeast of China. Uh, beautiful architecture, modernist. These are architects who've gone, traveled, studied in America and in Europe, come back with a bit of kind of uh, uh, sensitivity uh, to design and creativity over here and a little bit of no knowledge about how to get things built in China. Uh, fabulous building, if you ever get a chance. Uh, you can't see it very clearly, but the, that's the sea just out the window. You can have a nice contemplative read uh, in this wonderful uh, uh, library. Similarly, just down there, I mean, they've, <laughs> I don't know why they started building on the beach. Obviously, in the West, you wouldn't be allowed to because everyone's too, so paranoid about sea level rising. But they don't really mind. They want the sea to go underneath the building there. This is a church. Actually, it's a little bit of a folly, but I think it's a, one of the most beautiful buildings. You go inside, it's a fabulously contemplative space. The, uh, the crucifix, obviously, has been removed in the last uh, 12 months. Um, but it's, uh, you know, again, the idea that we perceive these things as being a bit... Uh, terrible architecture, whereas in fact there's lots of fabulous stuff going on. Long uh, Museum in Shanghai, again, a, a, a genuine cathedral uh, to, to art. Uh, and then this one, a little bit out of focus, this is um, a modernist uh, just in the Shishi Wetland Center in Hangzhou. Uh, again, beautiful, um, beautiful building. If you ever get a chance to go around it, completely deserted, completely empty, falling apart, uh, built only two years ago. Uh, so there's all these kind of weird, interesting contradictions about how we perceive it, uh, how do we, you know, what else do we know about China? We know it's polluted, it's terribly congested. Um, and this is a painting uh, by Monet back 150 years ago or so, uh, which, as we now know, the Impressionists in, uh, in uh, Britain were influenced. Uh, their vision was influenced by the haze and the pollution of London. Uh, this is uh, Beijing three years ago. Uh, and the idea that pollution could be an inspiration for creativity uh, is yet to be materializing in China, except when you see this. This is a kind of Shan Shui uh, ink wash drawing where the haze in the mountains is uh, all these little cranes and scaffolding and pollution of industry. So it's a, a commentary, if you like, on, on pollution. Um, but you have to think back that, you know, 1953 on the top left there, London's pollution. Uh, five years later, the Clean Air Act was introduced, and in many regards, pollution... I'm not going to say it was a thing of the past, but, you know, was in, in, in a large extent resolved. Uh, 12,000 people were killed in London in two weeks in 1953. Uh, uh, and then you have Beijing in 2015 on the right-hand side, uh, equivalent. The, the, the laughing stock of Chinese people wearing funny f uh, face masks and their animals. You know, obviously it was a regular scene in uh, London uh, in the time. So... What I'm saying is that actually there's some of these things are eminently solvable. So even when it comes to kind of pollution, environmental problems, that compression of history that we always talk about in terms of China, you know, like 300 years of Western development compressed into 50 or so in China. So we see the problems of that and the, and the solution, the resolution or the attempts at resolution also being compressed in time. And in many ways, the contradictions of the way we see architecture, the way we see urbanism, the way we see development in the West is reflected more so onto China. So I'm looking more at 
um, urbanism and architecture in this talk more so than any other topic, I suppose. This is uh, Liang Sechong, who is the father of modern architecture, uh, who started the first architecture university uh, in China. Um, but you see this kind of fantastic duality or I'd say it's a contradiction driven by the social reality of the time. So he was the guy that refound and reformulated the big hat roofs, or you know, the Chinese caricature now. Uh, but there he is in the 1920s doing this kind of traditional, you know, after the revolution, after May, uh, 1919, that idea about what does it mean to be Chinese, that historical view, while at the same time hankering for a little bit of modernism uh, of the West. Uh, and you see this kind of occurring in all lots of the great architects of that period. You know, they were playing around with the tradition, the official version, but they really were sneakily having an ambition for a little bit of Western brutalism. Uh, so it's an incredibly dynamic period. And I think some of that contradiction is prevalent today, maybe in a different guise. But, but this is uh, uh, Li Xiaodong, who is the head of the Beijing School of Architecture <coughs> in uh, Tsinghua School. <coughs> and this is the extension to the architecture department. This is a classic, only built uh, last year, a classic gridded steel, you know, modern uh, architectural form. This is how he made his name just five, six years ago, which is uh, the uh, Li Wen uh, Library just outside Beijing, which is uh, a, a, a kind of peon to local craftsmanship, uh, carpentry, uh, lo getting, getting the local community to build their own um, library facility, this twigs thing was gathered from all around the areas. And inside, you have this fantastically tranquil space. The funny thing is about this building is that just a year and a half ago, because it's been peopled by the local community and the library has been built by the local community, the authorities realized that 90% of the books were pornography. Uh, so, they, so they've closed it down. Uh, so you can't, you can't go there anymore. Anyway, um, so they, we know about that. Rapid urbanization is the other thing, of the, the, um, the other side to this kind of uh, beautiful architecture that goes on. Um, and this, I suppose, is some of the throwaway mantras that we've come to accept and use ourselves. You know, China building 400 cities in 20 years. Uh, so this was a headline from about 2005, 2006. Uh, this one from China Daily. This is the minister saying, uh, we're going to build 20 new cities like Shenzhen. Shenzhen is 15, 16 million people. Uh, we're going to build 20 new cities each year until 2020. Yes, so the idea of 20 new cities every year for 20 years, 400 cities, that's the story. And if you look at the facts, so there you are, there's in 2005, 500 or so cities, 25, 2025, there's 900 cities, 400 cities being created, yes? But if you look, if you can understand this graph, because it's a terrible diagram, you see that from nothing, they're building maybe 27 cities, yes, or large towns, yes? What they're really doing is they're taking small towns, making them middle size, middle size, large, big, mega, yes? So it's like an expansion. So it's not this kind of vision, which I had years and years ago, of the idea that China just kind of goes to the middle of the Gobi Desert and builds a city. I mean, they do, but, yeah, but that's by the by. But it's, it's, they, that, that's not 400 cities aren't just being created. This is a genuine expansion of what's there. So when I lived in Suzhou, outside uh, Shanghai, um, uh, you have you know, the UNESCO Heritage Suzhou, and then you have SIP, Suzhou Industrial Park, which is four million people as a, you know, just created alongside Suzhou. So I, even though I'm saying there's only, 20, only 27 cities being created, the fact that Britain hasn't built a city since 1975 kind of puts it in perspective. Um, so I think that there's some fascinating stuff going on, but obviously it's all over here. Yes. So one third of China is home to 92% of the population. Two thirds of China is home to 8% of the population. Yeah. Think about that for a minute. I mean, when you take a flight, if you ever fly into China, it'll probably take you about five, six hours to fly you know, when you won't arrive in, in Beijing. So this is a huge territory occupied by hardly any people at all. Um, and part of the problem with that is that you have this kind of urban imbalance where you have people moving, if I go back, from this kind of central region around... Uh, you know, around Lanzhou, around here, this central area, they're moving down to Shenzhen, to Shanghai, um, to get work, uh, the migration, the, the, the um, uh, congestion on the railways, all that causes. If you can maybe develop this area, all part of a global uh, soft power strategy, we're told. But generally, if you, you know, move along this line, 
uh, and you can start to build cities, you can start to create a little bit of economic dynamic along this route. So that's part of the, the deal is that to stop people flowing to the cities, to create a new dynamic internally to the country is part of the deal. And this is where they've now started to talk about clusters, um, like you see in the west coast of America for the last 50 years. Uh, they're starting to do it here. We all, the, the main one is this uh, Jingjingji uh, area just outside Beijing, given official, um, or Xiong'an, a uh, new town, be given official recognition by the uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, some of them are bonkers. I mean, you have Nanning and uh, Haiko. I don't know how that's going to work. Uh, there's about 100 miles of sea in between. Um, but, you know, some of these may or may not work, but you can see it's a sense of how do we create a new economic dynamic uh, within China? Um, how can we uh, improve development, consolidate what we have? That's the urban conversation. The contradiction, I would maybe argue, maybe it's not a contradiction, is that alongside rapid urbanization, you know, we're now up to 1978, it was 11% urban in China. Uh, now it's about 59, 60% urban. And remember, five years ago, it was 50%. Yes? So it's gone up 10% very, very rapidly. So that idea, but it can't go to 100%. Because you know, the peasantry, first of all, self-sufficiency in agriculture is a very big thing in China. Secondly, the political recognition about what the peasantry represents in some ways. You know, the noble pe uh, peasantry, noble farmer uh, plays a role. So what China is now doing is trying to encourage people not to leave the villages. Yes, also taking strain off uh, migrant labor. Um, as an, as an aside, and maybe we'll talk about this, uh, you know, the HUKO system, the internal passport system, already does that, right? Uh, so, you know, if you are born in a rural area, you get a rural passport stamp, uh, which means that if you do go to the city, you don't get the benefits. You don't get the education for your family. You don't get social services. Uh, you are effectively restrained in the village, even though you can travel to the city. So this is just a, a different way, a soft power way of doing it, which is to try and give a bit of dynamic to the rural areas. Uh, and masses of investment and big name architects, Chinese architects, are now getting huge amounts of money to build. This one here, for example, is uh, Chen Haru. This is a pig barn. Yes, this is an architect designed pig barn uh, in all the architecture magazines in the world. Uh, and this, this is uh, Wang Wei. She studied in New York, uh, came back, and she's gone straight to the rural development area, getting lots of grant funding and building these areas which give local villages integrity new ec economic development and, and uh, solidity and keeping people in the, in the rural areas, stopping them moving to the cities. Uh, okay, pause for breath, right. Uh, as we said, this, the, the development is <coughs> very heavily weighted towards the uh, East Coast. Um, we have uh, this kind of rapid growth of cities from the foundation of the Republic, uh, 120 cities moving up, building 40 cities or so, um, uh, 50 cities or so in, uh, in 10 years, and you see this kind of gradual growth of city urbanization, and then you have almost an exponential curve uh, to, towards the end of the 1970s and 80s, um, and heading up to 2025 to have 900 cities. Obviously, that gap in the, in the digits, <coughs> we have this thing which happened in China. Frank de Cotter's book is, uh, well, books are very useful to read uh, to give you a sense of perspective on China uh, before we get too carried away with how nice it is. Um, that, you know, millions of people were uh, reclassified, many, many towns and cities were reclassified. So you had this very strange situation of 50 more cities being added by 1962, and then by 65, 40 cities just disappeared. Yeah, so de-urbanization. The, you know, Mao was not necessarily a great urbanist. So cities, they didn't, they weren't demolished, you know, many of them still were standing, but they were, people who lived there were reclassified, the cities themselves were reclassified. So you have this de-urbanization policy. This is uh, Xi Jinping, uh, highly recommending my book. Um, but he's talking about <laughs> this idea about ecological civilization, which I think was mentioned at the beginning in a beautiful China. There's this new idea about what is it to build a new city in China. Yes, uh, so they had this rush to urbanization, uh, part of the developmental uh, ambitions economically. Uh, and now, in the same way as you had, I would argue, well, a similar way, you had maybe in Chicago at the end of the 20th century where, you know, people were pitchforked into the cities where they lived in you know, workhouses where pollution and disease and congestion was rampant. And then suddenly you develop this kind of master planning world Yes, uh, that you have Daniel Burnham coming here and basically saying we're now going to open up the waterfront, we're going to create boulevards, we're going to look to the, the French Baroque and try to create a new beautiful city for ordinary people. And 
I don't want to over-egg it, right? But there's something of a similar nature going on in, in China. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to be successful. I don't know whether they fully believe it, but it's kind of an important thing. So I, I'm just simply, in the, this is the 19th Congress. I just wanted to show you how influential uh, some of their reading is. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, but anyway, um, so when I started, right, when I proposed the book in 2011, there were seven equal cities, uh, seven chapters, nice little gig. I thought I'd knock it out very quickly. Uh, by 2015, when I started writing the book, there were 284 equal cities. Uh, the green book now, I think, has a, about 15 more added to it. Um, and obviously, the, it begs the question, what the hell is that about, right? That can't be true, can it? And of course, it isn't really. Uh, but they still use it predominantly because there is no definition of an eco city. I mean, what is an eco? What is sustainability? You know, we can we can have this conversation for weeks, can't we? Right? There is no definition of a of, unless you are the hippie who made up the the uh, definition. Uh, Richard Register, who invented the word eco city, says that it's a non-violent city, a place in which to make peace on Earth and with Earth. Uh, good luck with that. And uh, so by not having a definition, you end up having tick boxes. It just becomes urbanism by you know, spreadsheet. So on the left-hand side, I'm, I've looked at uh, Tianjin, uh, eco city, a dedicated eco city, one of the biggest, most heavily invested eco city in the world, by far more than Mazda in Abu Dhabi. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, London. And if you take a look at the criteria that... Um, uh, Tianjin Eco City set itself. Uh, you probably can't read it, I'm very sorry. Um, but uh, I've underlined a few, but I've gone through all of them. Uh, so ambient air quality is much higher, much better in London than it is in Tianjin. Per capita green space is nine times more in London than it is in Tianjin. The green trips by bus is the same. Uh, blah, blah, blah. You go through them all, I won't bore you with it, but you go through them all and you find that actually London is an eco city by a Tianjin Eco City definitional standard. Uh, and you would think that doesn't make any sense, does it? Or, or should we be saying that or should we be being a little, bit, little more, a little bit more critical? And I think ultimately I would argue that China is trying to develop nicer cities. Yes, and it's just happened to cotton on to a label which has purchase in the West and maybe is reinterpreting itself for itself. Uh, so the, here I have a discussion and definition in terms of the idea about what development means. And uh, Daniel Benami's book talks about growth skepticism and limits to growth. We know this from 50 years of, uh, of political writing. Whereas the Chinese have this green developmentalism discussion, which is about that you actually are not putting austerity on the agenda, that you actually are expanding your economy to the benefit of the, of the environment, but at the same time not to the detriment of ordinary people. Yeah? So on the West, there's much more of a we must rein in personally, uh, in order to benefit nature. And you see that in a lot of the writings, you know, Mao's famous quote about man must overcome nature, which is obviously always seen in the West as a symbol of how contemptible Chinese people really are. And they don't realize. Uh, whereas, in fact, you know, there's much more to that, that uh, definition than, than I can go into now. But again, this kind, of de this kind of conversation, this is just from a couple of weeks ago. This is the head of the Zero Emission Research in Initiative saying, I'm amazed by the Chinese rural people, how they deal with human waste, which can also be used as a fertilizer to plant crops. You know, basically how you can shit in a bucket, right, and put it on the ground. This is now heralded as some kind of uh, symbol of, uh, of development. And uh, Iro Palahaimo, who's a very famous uh, Finnish um, architect, urbanist, says China is a tourist attraction for designers. You put those two together where there's kind of fanciful romance of peasantry and the idea that China is a playground for architects to mess around, right, and you end up with this whole eco-city agenda. So this is where my book really starts this one, which is a visit to Iro Palahaimo's eco city just outside Beijing. Uh, um, I think it's uh, Mengoshan. Uh, anyway, I saw this. You can still see this online. There's fantastic praise for this eco city. Until you go there and you realize it doesn't exist. Yes? So it's, an, it's a fiction, it's an invention. So Iro Palahaimo makes a big claim of the fact that he can't get anything built in Finland. He can't build any of his ecosystems because all these bureaucrats and planners tell him that he's a madman, right? But he goes to China and he thinks, ah, brilliant. So he meets all these rich blokes and they say, yeah, let's build it. And of course, they're doing it because they want to get kudos and credence and a little bit more investment 
and uh, you know, branding for their area. He thinks he's been suckered and thinks he's onto a winner and he's finally going to build his eco vision. And in fact, it doesn't exist. But if you go online and check this out, there's still people writing saying what a great place this is. Because obviously nobody goes to these places, they just praise it. This is another one. This is, um, this is Chetwood Architects in, in London. Uh, again, you can't read this, but you know it's a, an eco, eco city because it has an insect hotel. Uh, <laughs> but, but just bonkers, right? Just bonkers. People are making livings of just creating this nonsense. This is an eco city by Vincent Calibo. Again, you know because you have sheep on the roof. Uh, <laughs> And, but it, however funny that might be, this is Arup, right, the biggest engineering company, one of the biggest engineering companies in the world who are developing a city called uh, Wanjuang Eco City. Uh, it isn't really happening yet, but it's still on the cards. They've come back to it. And they say the rural landscape in Wanjuang Eco City promotes close contact with nature. And one thing you know about Chinese people, just like people anywhere, right, is that backbreaking agricultural labor is not their, you know, their job of choice. Uh, and so actually, they don't want necessarily to have that close contact with nature in the way that lots of Western environmentalists are arguing. I got this example here, which is Bill McDonough. Some of you may have read, you know, um, Cradle to Cradle, his famous uh, book. Uh, but the, he was brought over by Deng Xiaoping's um, granddaughter, I think, or daughter, to develop this region. It's a v outside Benchy. Um, it's a very rural area, and his idea is preserving biodiversity. So he just cut out the squares of the land, build the buildings, and put the, put the soil and the thing back on top of it. Yes? So you don't affect biodiversity. Look from a satellite, it's exactly the same. Um, and you can see that here yeah, you have these noble peasants laboring away on the roof. Yes? So when they started, you know, here he comes, an American, rich American architect, comes to a village in China with great plans for development, everyone is delighted, happy, right? And then they start building it, and they say, so when are we going to get the job in there, right? And he says, no, 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 you're, you're, you're farmers, right? You know, <laughs> you don't want to disturb the whole, you know, balance of nature and everything. Anyway, they told to bugger off, uh, and it cancelled it. I went there 10 years ago, that was what's happened to it. I went there two years ago, and that's it now. It's a slum. I mean, this should be this should be broadcast more widely, right? This is an utter scandal. The millions that were wasted on this nonsense. Um, here's Vincent Calibo again, making it up. Uh, this is a futuristic eco city, uh, all about uh, you know, urban environment, uh, all about greenery, a, a vertical farming, vertical farming. This is the big idea that the West is offering China. <clears throat> because there's this, this notion, you see, from the Western perspective, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm using this very generally. Maybe you don't think this. But in general terms, there's this idea that, you know, we've developed in the West and we've made an ecological mess of things. Therefore, we have now a chance to influence China not to do it. Yes? So if only we can encourage them to maintain this beautiful, harmonious, uh, you know, it's almost Taoist, Confucianist kind of uh, har harmony, right? Uh, the mystical Chinese um, uh, ideas. If you can maintain that, then we can uh, make, some, make some ground. What we don't want to have is to have them industrialize and create all that carbon. Uh, so here's uh, another eco city. You can get the picture that round, roundness is, is very eco. Um, and actually, this is a, a consequence of that. This is a German architect, uh, Van Gerken Merg, uh, who are, this is a real city. This is actually being built uh, in Lingang, just south of uh, Shanghai. When you, when you come in, sometimes you fly over this. It's vast. It's vast. There's nobody there at the moment. Uh, but they are building it. They have six universities there now. The first thing you do when you build a city is you build the universities, a public with young people. Young people have spending power. You have local traders. Then you bring in the state industries. And it's just the, the, the port terminal. The biggest port terminal in the world is just off that little bridge down there. So there's a, meant to be an economic um, rationale for it. But there it is. So there, if I can point it out, uh, that's down here. And then this is Shanghai. And this is uh, Chongming Dao, the uh, Chongming Island. Um, where Dong Tan was to be built, if you remember Dong Tan, which never got built. Um, but the new big idea for Chongming Island is um, quite interesting, actually. What they're going to do is they're not going to develop it. Uh, so it's, if you go, it's a beautiful island, uh, very flat, lots of farming, peasant farming, um, and forests and what have you. And by not developing it, although I over-egg that, they are putting some hotels there and cycle routes and all the rest of it, but it's all about non-development for these people here. By not developing it, almost like one quarter of Shanghai's territory is green space. So you then tick the box as being an eco-city. 
Okay, so Shanghai is now uh, an eco city. That's what Dongtan might have looked like. Uh, this is uh, another ridiculous scheme that isn't going to be built uh, of Hainan, uh, designed by one of the biggest, best architects in America. Uh, this one is being built, but obviously not like that. Um, this is actually, I don't know if you know Garden City Developments, Ebenezer Howard, Garden Cities. This is a Garden City, China style. They actually got the Letchworth Garden City Trust, which, which comprises about six 85-year-olds, came over to China to advise them, uh, and this is what the American architects came up with. But it is actually uh, being built just on the southeast of uh, Chengdu. Uh, but the, the idea for this is it's going to be a smart city, it's going to be a networked city, it's going to have lots of um, electric buses and all the rest of it. So they, they're building in some of these networks even into these new areas. So I'm kind of getting to the uh, end point of this. I think partly might drift which, and it was a drift, I have to apologize, uh, is looking at the idea of the tensions between development and restraint and the tensions between Western interpretations about what China requires and is aiming for and what China itself is aiming for. Uh, so this here is, uh, you know, well, first of all, it's a quote from Tom Miller uh, saying that China's rapidly growing cities will remain ugly, congested, and polluted. And I think part of the deal is, is that China knows, you know, you don't have to be, that intelligent to know that many of China's cities are ugly, congested, and polluted. And they're now trying to remedy that, yeah, improve it. In Beijing, they, are, they have a policy to introduce green space into Beijing, a total of which will be 10 times New York Central Park area. Yeah? Not in one space, obviously, but they're going to try and do that. Um, uh, Xi'an is doing a very similar thing. So that idea about bring, enhancing uh, the necessity for rapid development has foregone the human element. And now they're trying to bring a bit of humanity into some of these cities, yes, by, uh, by well, by humanizing them, by bringing some nature and some niceness into it. So this is uh, Shanghai, uh, 1985. Uh, and and that's, what, that's what happens in 40 years. Uh, and less. Anyway, that I have more to say, but I'll stop now. Thank you very much, uh, and fully prepared to take your stick. <coughs> <coughs>